Welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational webinar series. I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. Today's webinar is about the PEXAVAS uh, trial. I, I hope I said that correctly, but we're grateful to have Dr. Mike Putnam with us today to educate us and answer some questions. And before we get started, I'd like to introduce him. So Mike Putnam is an assistant professor of medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where he is the medical director of the vasculitis program and maintains an active practice in general rheumatology. He's involved in education and currently serves as a program director for the rheumatology and associate and associate program director for internal medicine. His research interests include clinical trials in vasculitis, myos, Myositis. Myositis. <laughs> Myositis, big data epidemiology, and meta research. He's an associate editor of the journal Rheumatology and hosts the evidence based rheumatology podcast. Well, wow, you're very, very busy. So we appreciate your time today. And and I so I want to say welcome. And I wonder if you could also also give us any disclosures if you have any today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being here. It's a uh, always an exciting time to get to chat with the the VF. Um, I have di disclosures. I work with a number of uh, companies on clinical trials, um, and then I do have done consulting things as well. And it's all available if you have any questions. Um, so I um, am excited to talk about Paxvast. It's one of my favorite studies. Uh, it's a study that has really changed the landscape of ink associated vasculitis, and it's something that I think um, we hear a lot about and it's uh, affected our practice, but it's sort of hard to wrap your head around. So I was going to uh, share my screen here and give you what I think is a very grossly oversimplified infographic, uh, which still looks kind of crazy. But I think this is good context for what Pexavas did. So can you all see this right now? You can see it. Uh -huh. I'm, gonna, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I'm going to come back to this at the end again and sort of highlight some of the most important things to know about the Pexavas trial. So the first start thing to note is what does PEXAVAS even mean, right? So PEXAVAS means plasma exchange and glucocorticoids in severe inca associative vasculitis, or specifically the trial that was related to that. So this is a large randomized controlled trial that was conducted um, in 16 countries and included patients with inca associative vasculitis who either had renal involvement or pulmonary hemorrhage. And ultimately, they wound up enrolling 704 of these patients, which is an enormous number for a rare disease. But the first thing that I think people get hung up on when they're trying to understand literature like this is what does it mean that this was a trial? Uh, you know, when in our daily lives, we're always trialing things. I trialed a new kind of coffee this last week and it didn't taste very good. But that's not the trial that we mean in the same way that we talk about the Pexavas trial. So I want to explain a randomized controlled trial first. Now, when we are doing a randomized controlled trial, we start with the population of interest. Um, the population can really be anybody. It can be little or big. Uh, it can be any disease, whatever you want. And however you want to parameterize the group of people, whatever group of people you're studying, you, you, you grab a population of them. You can't randomize everybody with vasculitis. So we randomize some people with vasculitis and hope that that can generate information that is applicable to all of the community at large. And this is where the randomization word here becomes incredibly important. So this uh, is my infographic that I created, and I hope you like my little randomized wand there. Um, <laughs> I included the wand because randomization is magical. And randomization is magical for a couple of different reasons. If you think back to the coffee that I made um, earlier today, um, I picked it out. Um, it had a very pretty label on the front of the coffee. Uh, it smelled good when I opened it. Um, but I... I mean, I knew exactly what I was buying. There was no comparator group. And this wasn't a randomized trial. It was just a tr me trying something, right? And a randomized trial is very different than that. So in a randomized trial, what we do is we recruit patients to get into the study. And we say, hey, person who has newly diagnosed um, moderate to severe ANCA associative vasculitis, um, I want to um, treat you for this disease, but I have this trial. And um, if you would like to participate, you will be randomized to one of a couple different groups, one of two groups, one of four groups, depending on the trial. So in this case, um, we're when you randomize people to, and I'll talk about that in a second. But so the, the importance of this is that by randomizing people, we get rid of all the biases that usually affect medical decision making. Um, when you get randomized in the plasma in the PEXVAS trial to the plasma exchange arm, 
you um, are randomized to getting this treatment. And when you randomize to the non-plasma exchange arm, you're randomized to not getting that treatment. And you wind up in one of those groups, not because of some um, if, characteristic that's intrinsic to you or some preference of the doctor who's treating you, you wind up there because of this randomization process. And so it equilibrates a lot of the biases that affect medical decision-making and affect sort of smaller non-randomized data. The other thing is that when you randomize enough people, you wind up getting an even distribution of important characteristics. So you wind up getting about the same number of men and women, about the same number of racial groups, about the same number of degrees of illness. And then perhaps most importantly, the things that I just mentioned are all things that you can mention. But when you randomize people, you also get roughly the same number of unmeasurable things. So how many people do yoga? Um, how many people eat acai berries? Those things wind up being evenly distributed through the process of randomization, which is really a magical thing. Then you intervene, so you get something or you don't get it. We follow you over time, and then we assess some important outcome measure. So going back to the plasma exchange or the PEXAVAS trial, now this is really a little more complicated. This is, I think, where one, one place where people get hung up is that in the PEXAVAS trial, you were randomized to get plasma exchange or not. And plasma exchange um, is kind of complicated. So I am going to give a sort of high-level perspective of what plasma exchange is. Essentially, we... And I love the word malhumors because I love Spanish, but malhumor just means the evil spirits, okay? And in vasculitis, you know, we think that there are probably some pathologic antibodies and inflammatory mediators that are causing all kinds of trouble. And it makes sense that if we could just get rid of all of that stuff, people would do better, right? Um, I call those the malhumors. Um, it's just this collection of things that we suspect are causing disease pathology. So in a plasma, when we plasma exchange people, we will run your blood through a machine that will separate out the serum, give you all your cells back, but it will pull out most of those malhumors. We can never do it down to zero. We wind up getting 90 or 95% of your bad proteins and things like of that nature out. And then we give you proteins back from just a population of other folks who donated. So we get rid of the malhumors, hopefully, and we replace it with new proteins that hopefully don't have the same inflammatory milieu, the same antibody profile, the same trouble that was being caused. So that, that's what plasma exchange is. So upfront people randomize to get that or to not get that. Bear in mind that getting that is a little bit of logistically complicated. You have to be connected to a machine. Usually, although not always, there's some ways you can do it without it. Usually, at least in the United States, we give people a dialysis catheter, which is somewhat invasive. And then you have to do it sequentially many different times, usually five times or so over a one to two week period. So it's kind of logistically complicated. It's a relatively large intervention. And because it's so obvious, there was no blinding in the PEXVAS study. So everyone knew which groups they were in. And so that moment of randomization, when all the biases were fixed, once you start knowing exactly what treatment you're getting, some of these biases start to creep back in, right? You say, well, I got the treatment. Maybe I'll do really well. Or you're like, I didn't get the treatment. That's going to be hard on me. It starts to affect you, right? So bear in mind that this was not a randomized blinded study. This was just a randomized study. So now to make things complicated, but actually in a really beautiful thing that they did, in addition to randomizing people to plasma exchange, they randomized people to a standard steroid dose or a reduced steroid dose which is super important. One of the um, main drivers of bad outcomes in ANCA-associated vasculitis is infection. Steroids are one of the number one causes of infection, but we also need steroids to control the disease. And so finding a way to get less steroids and seeing if it's possible to give less steroids was an incredibly important goal. And one of the things that they assessed in this study. All right. Now, because you're randomized to either plasma exchange or none and reduced dose steroids or normal, that creates four different groups, right? Four different possibilities. You could get plasma exchange, get reduced, get plasma exchange, get none. You see, what, you see what I'm saying? So this is where it gets complicated, but you can analyze these groups with respect to each of the things that they're actually randomized to. So before I go back to this infographic again, I just want to jump ahead and show you um, the people who made it into this study. Um, and this is a relatively representative sample of people with moderate to severe ANCA associated vasculitis. So the age was around 63 years. Um, there was a slight male predominance. Um, most people um, were MPO positive, so microscopic pongitis, but still 41% or so were uh, anti-PR3 positive, so probably probably um, granulomatosis with polyngitis or GPA. Um, oops, don't advance on me. Um, and then critically, there's some important facts here that I've highlighted. So down here under kidney function, only about a third of people had really severe 
um, kidney involvement where they're undergoing dialysis or had really bad kidney disease. So bear in mind that this included people who had bad kidney involvement, but it wasn't necessarily enriched for all of them. And then the next thing is that only 9% of patients in Pexvas had severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So patients who come in with a little bit of inflammation or blood in their lungs would have made it. Um, that, that was more common. Most people had none. And so that um, influences, remember earlier when I said we look at a population, hope it applies to everybody. The lack of those people kind of affects how much we can apply it to everyone, in my opinion. But this is a picture of the primary outcome from the study. So um, on the left, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. They're kind of complicated to interpret. But on the bottom here, you have years. So you can tell we're following people over years. And then on the side here, on the side axis, where it says death or in-stage kidney disease, we have the primary outcome of the Paxivest study. And so when I say primary outcome, remember when I showed you that slide and I said we measure some outcome? Well, at the end of a trial, we want to know whether our intervention, which was in this case was plasma exchange or a reduced dose glucocorticoid regimen, we didn't know whether that intervention worked, right? And before we want to run the trial, we decide what we will define as success and or what the thing is that we're measuring for success. And so in this case, the answer was in a com combination of whether or not patients died or developed in stage kidney disease. And I think that's a great outcome because that really matters to patients. Um, sometimes in trials, you read it and you say, nah, man, it's important to get this thing. But I guess what's an ACR 20% response? You know, that's good. But, you know, it's not like the best thing imaginable, whereas um, not dying and not developing in-stage kidney disease is incredibly, incredibly important. So we, we, we looked at an incredibly important thing for our patients, and we found that plasma exchange, sucking out all the malhumors, didn't seem to affect that. So the red line here are people who got plasma exchange, the blue line are people who did not get plasma exchanged, and you can see over a five to six year period, there was really no significant difference in the rate of patients um, dying or developing end-stage kidney disease. And so this led to recommendations saying that we do not necessarily need to do plasma exchange for all patients with ANCA-associated vasculitis. Now, remember I said it was a factorial design, so there are two different things we, we looked into. We looked into the plasma exchange and we looked into a reduced dose steroid regimen. And here is the graph that shows that. Again, you have years on the on the x-axis here, um, going out five or six years for most patients. And then the y-axis here, you have that primary outcome that we talked about, death or end-stage kidney disease. What do we see? Well, it turns out that patients who got the standard do reduced dose steroid regimen, so got less steroids, had no difference in the outcome. And whereas that's kind of disappointing on the plasma exchange side, because it's like, ah, I really wish that this intervention had demonstrated that it worked so that I could roll it out and use it in important situations, kind of disappointed me a little bit. Well, this is actually really encouraging to know that patients don't need the standard dose regimen of glucocorticoids. When you look at this graph, that tells you people can get away with a lot less steroid than we have historically been giving them, which is huge progress. So coming back to my little infographic, like I said, we looked at all these 704 people with moderate severe ANCA associated vasculitis. We randomized them to plasma exchange or not, and to a reduced dose glucocorticoids or not. And then we assessed this primary outcome, which was an important outcome, death or end-stage kidney disease. And the plasma exchange group, there was no significant difference between the two. When you look at glucocorticoids, there was also no significant difference between the two as far as the main important outcome measure was concerned. But... They also said, what about infections? And this is a really important question because, like I said at the beginning, infections are an important driver of bad outcomes in ANCA-associated vasculitis. And what we saw was that people who got less steroids had fewer infections. Makes sense. That kind of tracks. But this kind of establishes this as kind of a win-win, right? It doesn't look like outcomes were worse, and it looks like infections were better. So that's kind of the big take home from this study. Really cool study, really big study. We looked at this plasma exchange business to take, take out the malhumors, and then we looked at reduced dose steroids. We found that removing the malhumors didn't seem to help in this study, at least. We found that giving reduced dose steroids was acceptable and associated with less infections. And so those are the two headlines from the PEXVAS study. Now, before we go on to the answer question and answer session here, uh, I just wanted to note a couple important limitations. So with every study, there are limitations. No study is perfect. 
And with the PEXVAS study, I alluded to this earlier, but I'm a little worried about it because when you look at the number of people who had really severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, there just weren't that many of them. Um, if you want to hear a debate between myself and Dr. Mike Walsh, who's one of the, the authors on this, you can listen to that. It's on my podcast. But um, we, uh, you know, his perspective, and I think it's entirely plausible, is he says, you know, this study included more patients with severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage than we've ever seen. Um, there's no, he doesn't think there's a, a reason that this wouldn't scale if we saw more of them. And he says, look, we know that um, these patients um, are at risk of infection. You know, the, the worse your alveolar hemorrhage, probably the worse your risk of infection. And so he says, you know, I would not um, recommend doing plasma exchange and I would give reduced dose steroids. I think that's a very defensible position. Um, and he's a smarter guy than I am. I I tend to modulate my steroids a little bit, though. When people are really sick, I do give a little more steroids. I'm a little worried about the disease taking off. And for people who have really bad severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, I still consider pl plasma exchange because I'm not sure it applies to them. Now, one thing that Dr. Walsh and I both agree on uh, is that people with really aggressive kidney disease probably still benefit from plasma exchange. And uh, even though th this primary outcome measure in this study wasn't met, if you look at other studies of plasma exchange, combine them in this thing called a meta-analysis and look at all the combined data, you see that there's probably a little bit of a benefit for kidney recovery to get plasma exchange. And I think that's really only applies to people with severe kidney disease. And so I don't do this for folks with a little bump in their creatinine. But if you have really bad aggressive kidney disease, I think plasma exchange is something that your doctor should be considering. These are the 2021 ACR VF recommendations uh, for the management of Inca associated vasculitis. I just want to highlight that this study was included in those guidelines and did have an immediate impact on clinical care. They said that for patients with active glomerulonephritis, we recommend against routinely adding plasma exchange. Caveat myself and some people still do if it's pretty bad. And then they said in patients with active severe um, ankyl associated vasculitis with alveolar hemorrhage, we can just recommend against adding plasma exchange to remission induction therapies. Caveat, I still do it for people who are very, very ill, but I do not recommend this for people who are not very, very ill. And then these guidelines endorsed a low dose glucocorticoid regimen from the study. So um, very impactful, very important trial. One of my favorite trials, um, heroic effort by all the people who are a part of it. Um, and something that I think is provide a lot of tangible benefits for people with vasculitis. So that's my, that's my little introduction. And I'm here for a question and answer if you have any questions. Well, we do have a few questions, but thank you so much for explaining that to me on a level that I could understand. Um, I actually, as a patient, had a couple of questions. When... A study like this happens and they make new recommendations, for instance, that as you said, uh, plasma exchange is not necessarily recommended in most cases now just to, for people that are super sick. I had plasma exchange, so that's kind of what got me thinking about this. Um, but I was very, very, very ill at the time. Um, I, does that change for patients like as far as insurance and things is because there are new recommendations that make it harder for us to get these things if if you're the doctor and you see me and I really need it you know that's a complicated question you know insurance is a great big black box and so I don't know that I can make any definitive statements on that I will say that because this is uh something that is almost exclusively done in hospital settings that what winds up happening is we recommend it. It's done during the hospital stay. And then the hospitals fight the insurance companies and who, who knows what comes out the other end of that whole negotiation. So um, it, it guideline recommendations are important in getting things covered. But when it comes to plasma exchange, because of the typical hospital setting, it's a little, a little less, um, uh, a little less clear where, how that all shakes out. I just wondered if that meant doctors would lean away from that because of that. But when you're in the hospital and you are that sick, I I presume they just do whatever you need to, to have done. And, you know, those details get worked out later. Um, I'm very grateful that I had plasma exchange because I was I was not in a good place is, is what I was told. <laughs> um, I did want to ask you, um, there's somebody, one of the patients that was looking at the PEXAVAS study said, I'm stuck on this one sentence in the description. The primary outcome is the time to the composite of all cause mortality and end stage renal disease. Yeah. I, she just wants to know what that means. 
Yeah. And so there's a lot of things to unpack there. So, and a lot of this comes to a bunch of statistical chicanery that, you know, you don't need to get too into. Um, I, so let me just parse that. So the time to, so we analyze this as the time to an event. So we're asking your risk with respect to, as a, as a function of the time to the event. Okay. Which is really confusing. Just think of it as, um, uh, uh, just think of it as, uh, just take a step back and think about this in, in a broader context. You know, if you're a patient with moderate to severe ankyl associated vasculitis, you don't want to develop certain things, right? Um, being on the ventilator would be one of them, um, developing kidney damage, and then of course dying. And so what we said in this trial, or what they decided when they designed this trial, they said, we're going to pick the things that matter the most. And that's trying to keep people alive and then trying to prevent them from developing in-stage kidney disease. And so they said, those are the things that we're going to measure as our endpoint, the outcome, how we're, how we're measuring success in this case. And so when they say composite, they mean they just looked at those two things together because they're not that, you know, if you choose them individually, there won't be as many people. And for some statistical reasons, it's a little bit better to catch more. Um, and so that's what, so that's what they mean by composite. They're looking at both of those things and then the time to don't get hung up on that. Um, <laughs> for there's some statistical reasons that you do that. It, it makes things um, a little better easier. Um, but uh, I don't think it's it's worth getting too worried about the time to part. <laughs> okay, well, that all makes sense. How about another translation for me, though? <laughs> this, this sentence says, additional potential beneficial effects of PLEX in AAV include removal of other mediators of inflammation and coagulation and effects on immunoregulation. Okay, I love it. <laughs> That's quite the sentence. <laughs> So let me give some thoughts here. And so when I think about this, I try to get too hung up on uh, the theoretical benefit of therapies. There was certainly a theoretical benefit. And this comes back to what I was saying earlier about the malhumors. Like we know when you have moderate severe ink associated vasculitis, there are some pathologic antibodies and probably some inflammatory mediators and some things that if we just got rid of them, you'd probably do better. So that was the idea. Uh, I'm an empiricist though. And at the end of the day, getting rid of those things as well as we could in a very large randomized controlled trial did not seem to help people in a meaningful way. Caveat, I do think there's probably benefit for people with bad kidney disease and possibly for very bad lung disease. But that second one especially is very controversial. Uh, but no, for most people, it didn't seem to help the way that we thought it would have. So um, I think that it's really easy to get hung up on the theoretical benefit of things. But uh, more importantly, when the rubber meets the road, did it work? And in this case, plasma exchange did not have a significant benefit um, with respect to this population. Yeah, I, I did. As a patient, I did hear that that study was being done and that that was the outcome of it. So it's great to have you explain it. There's someone, another patient that asked this question, is the PEXAVAS study still recruiting patients? I think I know the answers, but just so that you can go over it, how long has the study been in progress? And could you explain where we are in the research timeline for PEXAVAS? And I just think she wants to know, are there additional phases of the study coming? Because you just no. said it's done. <laughs> no. I think that uh, when I said, I think I said this was a heroic effort by the people who were involved, and it was a heroic effort. Um, you have to bear in mind that this is, uh, there is not a lot of funding for running randomized controlled trials that are investigated, initiated, investigator initiated like this. And a, a lot of folks were carving out time from their day jobs, family, stuff like that to, to run this study, which is valuable and important. Um, but it is also was a very big undertaking and um, it has concluded. There are no more enrollments into the PAXVAS study um, at this point, and they're not going to be enrolling more people. Um, that said, there are there's an enormous amount of data that came from PAXVAS. So you're going to keep seeing papers emerge as we get more analysis. So um, there's there's papers being published from the trial on a regular basis, probably will be for the next year, couple of years or so. Um, but they're smaller and smaller and more niche and niche. The big, the big take home points were all in the original paper, I think. Um, and there's, there's, unfortunately it, it is, it is, it is concluded. <laughs> well, yeah. we got, we got the information that we needed from it. So that, that's great. Um, and I did want to say that it, it seems like this study in the scale and international involvement has uh, a lot of value as a model for like collaborative research. Can you elaborate on how a study like PEXAVAS is helping to set the standard for large scale studies down the road? 
Absolutely. I'm, I'm particularly interested in this. You know, I think that there's a couple of things that made Pex of Ass possible, and I was not a part of it, but just he, from the outside looking in, um, you know, for one, there was a, a group of dedicated clinicians and patient advocates and people um, with the Vasculitis Foundation and um, funding agencies who tried to make it happen. So I think that's one important thing is you have to have a lot of support um, and you need to have uh, a lot of institutional support to run efforts like this. The second thing is that they're very creative. I mean, doing this factorial design, we don't see that very often. And they got a lot of information out of the study in part because of that. Uh, I think we should be doing a lot more factorial designs, especially in some of these pharmaceutical studies where pharmaceutical companies are spending billions of dollars to run a study. I mean, throw me an arm where they look at different steroid tapers or give me like a methotrexate or none arm as well. You know, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to be doing things like this, where we get the most we can out of um, this enormous effort of in recruiting people and randomizing people and following people. Why don't we randomize twice or something like that? Um, so those are the first two take on points. And then the third take on point is just the importance of randomized controlled trials in general. Um, there's a reason that we're not talking about the observational data that I do. Uh, you know, I do observational research. I love it. I think I can answer some small, important questions, but you will never get as uh, reliable as an answer with an observational study. You will with a large, well-conducted randomized controlled trial as we did here. So I think just emphasizing the value of randomization as a thing that we do in medicine to answer important clinical questions is a, is a real legacy of PEXAVAS. Well, thank you for explaining all of that to us and for maybe giving us a more thorough knowledge of the PEXAVAS uh, trial itself so that we understand the plasma exchange part of it and also the reduced steroids. That was interesting too. And I did want to say thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Uh, I also like to tell the um, viewers, so I'm going to share my screen for a minute, about how they can actually help with, uh, some patients wonder do you ever, how you can have an impact on important vasculitis research. And the answer is that you should join the VPPRN, which is the Vasculitis Patient Powered Network. And I'm a, a patient champion for the VP VPPRN, and I encourage other patients to join it as well. There's some biannual forms that you'll fill out. It's very simple. Um, I can't tell you everything about it. So if you'll just visit the VPPRN.org website, um, you'll find that it is a global patient registry and that patient data drives research in vasculitis by providing researchers with important information about you and your experience. And that's key for advancing our knowledge of vasculitis. So today we would also like to thank the Vasculitis Foundation for their uh, support in hosting these medical webinars and our sponsors, Amgen and AstraZeneca and Novartis. And of course, thank you, Dr. Putman, for explaining things to us today. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That